Welcome back to Hourglass Channel. Find yourself a suitable sitting position to start your journey today. Who do you think you are, plotting meticulously to claim ownership of the cake? Will that allow you to venture into the vast paradise with the belief that you can win the most coveted prize, surpassing even the greatest achievements in history? We've all witnessed the glitz and glamour of Hollywood's elite, but what about their hidden shadows? Today, we reveal the dark undercurrents of the entertainment industry, shedding light on the dark side of your beloved stars. Let's start. Charlie Chaplin, famous comedian, is often praised for his humor, but also criticized for his selfishness and abuse of his children and teenage wife. Chaplin's first wife was Mildred Harris. They married in 1918 when she was 16 and he was 29. Although they had a son, their marriage was short-lived due to his son's early death. He then married Lita Gray in 1924. However, their marriage ended in 1927 after the birth of two children and a tumultuous divorce. In 1936, Chaplin married Paulette Goddard, but their relationship ended in separation the following decade. His last marriage was to Una O'Neill in 1943, when she was 18 and he was 54. Despite their significant age gap, they had a strong relationship and had eight children. Chaplin believed in the vitality of youthful romance, seeing it as the source of eternal youth. His last wife, Una, lived only 14 years. Sadly, despite the significant age difference, she still succumbed to alcoholism, depression, and loneliness. Chaplin's life lacked a sense of childhood, and Ona was his only companion until his death, which was the main reason he left. Her lasting legacy lies in the countless children she bore him, whom he loved dearly. Despite Chaplin's personal difficulties, his legacy lives on through a series of impressive works that continue to captivate audiences around the world. John Wayne wielded his influence during the classic era of Hollywood. His conservative political views and controversial personal opinions created a storm among his peers. Some co-stars found themselves at odds with the cinema legend due to his outspoken beliefs. Among those who felt the sting of Wayne's vitriol was none other than the legendary Clark Gable. Gable, celebrated for his looks and talent. However, what should have been a harmonious collaboration turned into a tumultuous relationship on set. Ford's comments about Gable's appearance and age soured the atmosphere, leading to frequent clashes between the two Hollywood giants. The breaking point came when Ford's disrespect extended beyond Gable to include his co-star, Ava Gardner. Gable, incensed by Ford's treatment of the actors and his disregard for their feelings, walked off set multiple times, severing ties with the director for good. John Wayne's daughter, Aissa Wayne, shed light on the long-standing feud between Gable and Ford, revealing its lasting impact on her father's perception of the fellow actor. In her book, John Wayne, My Father, Aissa explained that the animosity simmered for years, with John Wayne staunchly standing by Ford. To Wayne, speaking ill of Gable became a course of action, even if he had no personal qualms with the actor. He's extremely handsome in person, Wayne remarked. But Gable's an idiot. Do you know why? Gable's an actor. It's the only thing he's smart enough to do. Such remarks, while reflecting Wayne's disdain, also raise questions about the industry's perception of intelligence and talent. Joan Crawford. Few revelations in Hollywood have shocked the world as profoundly as Christina Crawford's tell-all memoir, Mommy Dearest, published in 1978. In this explosive expose, Christina peeled back the glamorous facade surrounding her mother, the legendary Hollywood film star Joan Crawford, revealing a dark and abusive reality that lurked behind closed doors. At the tender age of 13, Christina's perception of her mother as a loving figure shattered. A traumatic incident, etched into her memory, involved Joan grabbing her by the throat, delivering a punch to her face, and slamming her head against the floor. Even after 55 years, 
Christina vividly recalls the harrowing details, emphasizing how close her mother came to inflicting fatal harm. It was up close and personal. She came this far from my face, and you could see it in her eyes. You can see if someone is trying to kill you, Christina reflects. What made Joan Crawford's case particularly chilling was the stark dichotomy between her public persona and the private torment Christina endured. To the world, Crawford was the epitome of Hollywood glamour, a celebrated actress whose career spanned five decades, starring alongside icons like Clark Gable and Betta Davis. Her fame reached its zenith in the 1940s, earning her accolades, including a Best Actress Academy Award in 1945 for Mildred Pierce. Despite the glossy magazine spreads depicting a happy family life and her sprawling Los Angeles mansion, Christina saw through the facade. A year after Crawford's death, Christina unleashed the truth in Mommy Dearest, accusing her mother of sadistic perfectionism, alcoholism, and unpredictable fits of maternal rage. The autobiography painted a portrait of a woman who, behind the scenes, wielded her power not as a nurturing parent, but as a tyrant, punishing the slightest transgressions with disproportionate cruelty. Betta Davis's autobiography, The Lonely Life, and its 1,987 follow-up. This and that unleashed a torrent of opinions, ranging from sharp critiques to surprisingly tender reflections, offering a glimpse into a life that transcended the narrative presented in the 2017 series feud, chronicling her infamous rivalry with Joan Crawford. Davis's relentless pursuit of perfection stemmed from a complex relationship with her father, Harlow, a stern and demanding Harvard-trained patent lawyer. In a poignant moment described in The Lonely Life, Davis recounted staring at the stars with her father, who imparted a lesson that fueled her determination. Do you see all those stars up there? There are millions and millions of them. Remember that always, and you'll know how unimportant you are. This paternal challenge became a driving force in Davis's life as she sought to prove her worth to herself and the world. Her journey wasn't without adversaries, and two prominent figures loomed large among them, Jack Warner, the head of Warner Bros. Studio, and her eternal rival, Joan Crawford. Davis spared no words in her assessments, accusing Crawford of being a vain, vodka, and Pepsi-selling skilled sexual politician. The tension between the two Hollywood icons reached its zenith during the filming of Feud, with freezing sets and Crawford's insistence on impeccable nails, adding fuel to the fire. As Davis navigated the tumultuous waters of Hollywood, her opinions resonated beyond the silver screen. She was unapologetically herself, a maverick challenging the norms of an industry that often resisted change. In her words, I will not retire while I've still got my legs in my makeup box. Jerry Lewis is renowned for his iconic partnership with Dean Martin and his tireless efforts in hosting fundraising events for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Lewis was a man of two sides, the celebrated entertainer and the tormented soul. Often dubbed the Dark Prince of Comedy, Lewis navigated a tumultuous life that mirrored the highs and lows of his comedic style. From an unhappy childhood to an unfaithful marriage, from drug addiction to a suicide attempt, and from controversy to debilitating illnesses, his journey was marked by profound struggles. Despite his success and influence on comedy, Lewis grappled with personal demons that often overshadowed his public persona. His slapstick style, a comedic artistry that influenced figures like Michael Crawford's Frank Spencer in Some Mother's Davum in Hollywood, a lister Jim Carrey, showcased the depth of his impact on the industry. Jim Carrey, paying tribute to Lewis, encapsulated the sentiment shared by many, I am because he was. Even Martin Scorsese, who directed Lewis in the 1983 film The King of Comedy, acknowledged him as truly one of our greats. However, behind the accolades and laughter lay a darker reality. Accusations of cruelty and abuse haunted Lewis's personal life with his youngest son Joseph publicly stating that he endured routine physical and mental abuse from his father. 
The strained relationship led to Jerry cutting ties with Joseph, who tragically passed away from an overdose in 2009 at the age of 45. Jerry's response to his son's death, marked by silence and absence, spoke volumes about the complex dynamics within the Lewis family. In a rare moment of vulnerability, Jerry Lewis admitted to self-flagellation over his son's death, confessing to beating himself up a thousand times. He revealed, I've worked under the most painful conditions any man has ever felt in his life, but when I walk out on that stage, the pain goes away. James Dean, the iconic actor immortalized for his roles in classics like Rebel Without a Cause, may be celebrated on postage stamps, but a closer look reveals a tumultuous personality that leaves many questioning the adoration. Depicted as obnoxious in Donald Spoto's Rebel, the life and legend of James Dean, the actor's off-screen behavior raises eyebrows considering the accolades he received posthumously. According to Spoto, Dean was excessively rude, foul-mouthed, and unprofessional, earning the disdain of many co-stars. His brief stint on Broadway in productions like See the Jaguar, 1952, and The Immoralist, 1954, was marred by tales of uncooperativeness and moodiness. Robert Mann, the press representative for the latter play, didn't mince words, stating, James Dean was the most uncooperative, the moodiest, and most offensive actor I've ever worked with. Even the late Rock Hudson, who shared the screen with Dean and Giant, found him challenging to be around. Hudson remarked that Dean was hard to be around, never smiled, was sulky, and had no manners. Despite these anecdotes, Dean's enigmatic persona, marked by rebellion and an untimely death at 24 in a gruesome auto accident, has garnered an immense cult following. While novels, plays, and songs like The Beach Boys' A Young Man Is Gone have romanticized Dean's life, not every portrayal has been adoring. In 1993, conservative columnist George will lay blame on Dean, attributing the youthful unrest of the 1960s to his film personality. Will contended that in Rebel, Dean played himself, a mumbling, arrested development adolescent, to perfection, feeling mighty sorry for himself as a victim of insensitive parents. Yet, Dean's complexity extended beyond the surly Rebel image. Creative, intellectually curious, and ambitious, he was also manipulative and selfish. Accounts from actors who worked with him reveal a less glamorous side. Von Taylor, an actor who collaborated with Dean on TV recalled decades later, the actor's vulgar, self-congratulatory, and rude behavior. Dean's improvised stage movements caused chaos, disrupting other actors' performances and infuriating directors. Lucille Ball, the queen of comedy, was an influential figure in the entertainment industry. However, behind the scenes of Here's Lucy, a 1971 episode titled Lucy and the Mountain Climber, revealed a side of Ball that some found challenging to navigate. During a guest appearance by Tony Randall, who was at the height of his popularity on The Odd Couple, he witnessed Ball's strong-willed demeanor in the episode. Randall played a mountain climber who Lucy believed she could outdo. Reflecting on the experience, Randall noted, a lot of people found her very, very tough to work with. She bossed everybody around and didn't spare anybody's feelings. Despite the challenges, Randall acknowledged that Ball's assertiveness was part of what made her a comedic genius. He remarked, however, he also saw Ball's attitude and dedication to making the best possible show as part of what made her such a comedic genius. I didn't mind that because she knew what she was doing. If someone just says do this, it's awful if they're wrong. If they're right, it just saves a lot of time, and she was always right. Steve McQueen's wife, Neely Adams, accompanied him on a tumultuous journey from the 1950s to the 1970s, bearing witness to the dark side of this Hollywood legend. Their marriage, 
marred by McQueen's serial womanizing and various addictions, took a harrowing turn one fateful night. Adams, aware of her husband's cocaine habit, resisted his persistent attempts to involve her. However, McQueen's charm was a facade for a more menacing reality. I wish you wouldn't fight me on this, he allegedly pleaded. I promise you, a little coke will make you feel better. I don't want you feeling bad, baby. No matter what happens, you're still my baby. As the night unfolded, fueled by lines of cocaine, McQueen's paranoia escalated. He accused Adams of infidelity, prompting a teasing response from her about a mysterious Academy Award-winning lover. In a chilling moment, McQueen, overcome with rage, retrieved a gun from his pocket and pressed it against Adams's temple. The threat that followed was nothing short of horrifying. You would better tell me now, or you're not gonna live to see him die. And I promise you, I'll find out who he is. Make no mistake about that, he whispered menacingly. Kirk Douglas, born Ashur Danielovich Dembski to Russian Jewish immigrants in 1916, embarked on a journey from humble beginnings to becoming an iconic actor, reflecting the evolution of American cinema. His cinematic achievements were marked by a role in breaking the Hollywood blacklist, which was as significant as the on-screen performances he delivered. A key part of the production of Spartacus, Douglas hired Dalton Trumbo, a blacklisted writer, to pen the script. This move not only demonstrated Douglas's commitment to artistic freedom, but also contributed to its abolition. However, after his death, a different story emerged from the oppressive Hollywood blacklist, one shrouded in an allegation that had circulated for years. Rumors claimed that Douglas had sexually assaulted a teenage Natalie Wood in the 1950s, casting a shadow over his legacy. The unverified story suggested Douglas invited the 15-year-old girl to his room at the Chateau Marmont and subjected her to hours of assault, callously warning her not to speak out. While the authenticity of this account remains unconfirmed, social media quickly became a battlefield of conflicting praise and accusation. Douglas, wrongly labeled a pedophile and rapist, faces a retrospective trial by public opinion. An assertion by a film critic that he was most likely a sexual predator who went unpunished and unchallenged for half a century encapsulates the divisive nature of the posthumous reckoning. Mickey Rooney, with his boyish charm, illuminated the golden age of Hollywood, earning four Academy Award nominations. His collaborations with Judy Garland and his portrayal of Andy Hardy epitomized post-war optimism and small-town innocence, captivating audiences. However, behind the scenes, Rooney's off-screen persona diverged drastically from his on-screen characters. Rooney's struggle with gambling and substance abuse cast a shadow on his public image. Reports of his inappropriate behavior on set, including auditioning young actresses on the infamous casting couch for non-existent roles, paint a disturbing picture. One particularly alarming allegation suggests an affair with Elizabeth Taylor while Rooney was in his 20s, revealing a Mickey Rooney starkly different from the honest and innocent characters he portrayed. Described as blisteringly bombastic, abrasive, and nasty, Rooney's professional demeanor was far from amicable. His unkind remarks about co-stars, including derogatory comments about Elizabeth Taylor, exemplify a darker side that contradicts the public's perception of him. Even after completing productions, Rooney's poor professional behavior persisted. Following his co-starring role with Elizabeth Taylor in National Velvet in 1944, Rooney disparaged the young star, labeling her as entitled and lacking talent. Faye Dunaway's recent reported tumultuous downfall highlights the plight of the 78-year-old silver screen icon. Dunaway, ousted from her role in At Five, stands accused of physical assault, tantrums, and bizarre demands on set. Dunaway's alleged behavior has been a topic of discussion for years. 
One alarming incident involved Rutania Alda, who claimed during the filming of Mommy Dearest in 1981 to have been genuinely slapped by Dunaway. Alda recounted that instead of a stage slap, Dunaway struck her on the cheek hard and for real. Beyond on-set altercations, Broadway wig designer Paul Huntley revealed an incident during a 1966 tour of Masterclass where Dunaway, dissatisfied with the presentation of hairpins, reportedly slapped Huntley's assistant's hand, leaving the assistant horrified. Page Six also revisited a claim from the book Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, alleging that Dunaway made Teamsters flush her toilet on the set of Chinatown in 1974. She supposedly peed in trash cans and threw a cup of urine at director Roman Polanski when denied a bathroom break. In response, Dunaway stated that she had no recollection of these events and deemed them ridiculous. James Woods shared his encounter with Dunaway during the filming of The Disappearance of Amy in 1976, claiming she threw something at him for ad-libbing. Woods criticized Dunaway's rudeness, contrasting it with Betta Davis, who reportedly considered Dunaway among the worst people in Hollywood. Page Six also reported Dunaway's failure to learn lines for the at five, supported by singer Jill So's recollection of Dunaway's behavior during the disappearance of Amy. Sue so described Dunaway as hours late, in a foul mood, yelling at people, and storming off the set, creating a scene reminiscent of Valley of the Dolls. Elizabeth Taylor's life was ablaze with the scandalous love affair that unfolded between her and singer Eddie Fisher. The twist in this tale was that Fisher was initially the best man in Taylor's third wedding to producer Mike Todd, who tragically passed away. Meanwhile, Fisher was married to actor Debbie Reynolds, and the social dynamics of these two couples were about to take a dramatic turn. Taylor and Reynolds had a long-standing friendship dating back to their teenage years, but the sudden loss of Todd shifted the dynamics. Taylor found solace in Fisher, leading to an affair that scandalized Hollywood. However, the fallout was not evenly distributed. While Taylor and Reynolds weathered the storm, Fisher faced the brunt of public outrage and professional consequences. The affair had a severe impact on Fisher's career, with contracts being canceled due to morality clauses. Todd Fisher, Eddie Fisher's son, revealed the extent of the fallout, stating, it literally ruined his career. I mean, it just wiped him out. Despite Fisher being both a singer and actor, his professional life took a significant hit, and even his struggle with drug abuse added to his challenges. Reflecting on the aftermath, Fisher acknowledged the overshadowing effect of his romantic life on other aspects, saying in 1991, it wasn't my intention for my romantic life to overshadow other aspects. The marriage between Elizabeth Taylor and Eddie Fisher lasted for five years, but began to unravel two years in. Taylor's iconic role in Cleopatra, alongside Richard Burton, fueled a highly publicized affair that eventually led to a divorce between Taylor and Fisher in 1964. Taylor and Burton went on to have their own highly publicized romance, marrying shortly after the divorce. Debbie Reynolds, reflecting on the doomed union, foresaw its demise, commenting, I warned Eddie that she'd kick him out after a year and a half, and that's exactly what happened, which gave me at least a little comfort. Frank Sinatra found himself in an unexpected predicament that landed him behind bars, charged with seduction, a serious accusation in the moral climate of the 30s. Sinatra was accused of corrupting an upstanding single woman in the community. The charge, eventually dismissed, led to Sinatra's brief stint in jail. However, his tryst with legal troubles didn't end there. On December 22 and of the same year, Sinatra was back in jail, this time facing charges of adultery. Authorities discovered that Sinatra's lady friend was married, intensifying the legal scrutiny. Despite the initial fervor, the case was dropped, and Sinatra spent a total of 16 hours in jail before regaining his freedom. This episode highlighted Sinatra's womanizing reputation and added a unique chapter to his storied life. In a surprising turn of events, the infamous J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, I took a keen interest in Frank Sinatra. Hoover, known for his conservative values and opposition to figures he deemed subversive, opened an FBI file on Sinatra. 
However, despite the extensive 1,300-page file, the FBI struggled to find substantial evidence against the iconic singer. The declassified FBI file, dating back to Sinatra's death in 1998, revealed investigations into Sinatra's associations and health records. While there were claims that Sinatra volunteered as an FBI informant, the real curiosity lay in the file's origin. An anonymous tipster writing to Hoover in 1943 expressed concern about Sinatra's shrill whistling sound created by girls cheering during his performances. The letter suggested that such mass hysteria could be manipulated, leading to the creation of another Hitler in America. Hoover, ever vigilant, agreed with this assessment, initiating a 40-year investigation into the man whose voice stirred passionate devotion. Frank Sinatra's life, marked by legal entanglements and FBI scrutiny, showcased the intersection of entertainment, morality, and political paranoia in 20th century America. Greta Garbo was not only known for her captivating performances, but also for her high-handed and sometimes cruel demeanor. In one memorable incident, Garbo managed the unthinkable, hurting the feelings of the usually unflappable Marion Davies during the filming of a scene. Both actresses found themselves on the same soundstage, separated only by the usual canvas. Davies's set had an open and almost festive atmosphere, complete with a high English tea served during breaks. Intriguingly, Garbo, known for her elusive nature, decided to breach the usual barriers. She entered Davies's set, took a seat in Davis's chair, and observed for nearly half an hour. Flattered and delighted, Davies decided to reciprocate the gesture. As Davies asked her director if there was a scene that could proceed without her, intending to visit Garbo's set, what followed was unexpected. Greta Garbo, sensing an intrusion, abruptly halted the filming, demanding to know who was present. Fred Niblo, the director, swiftly instructed Davies to leave, emphasizing Garbo's strict rule against anyone on her set. Undeterred, Davies explained, I know, but Miss Garbo came on my set, and I thought I'd repay the compliment. Attempting to defuse the tension, Davies engaged Garbo in conversation on her own set, displaying her social graces. However, Garbo, with her trademark disdain, dismissed Davies' attempt at camaraderie in a cutting remark, claiming, You're very funny. You make me laugh. I didn't come over to see you. I came over to see a really great actress. The impact of this insult brought tears to Davies' eyes, but Garbo remained unapologetic. As Davies left, Garbo's final words stung, To me, you're null and void. This incident, recounted by Marion Davies, exemplifies Garbo's complex and solitary nature, which often bordered on peevishness. Despite Garbo's friends defending her as merely slightly cranky, such incidents reveal the less charming aspects of her personality. Davies, at a later reception attended by Garbo, remarked, I never saw anyone so peculiar or so shy, and that sang a lot for this town, a town known for its eccentricities and larger-than-life persona. Orson Welles, at Maison, showcased his unapologetic irreverence when confronted by Richard Burton's attempt at a friendly exchange. Burton, extending pleasantries, proposed introducing Elizabeth Taylor to Welles. However, Welles, immersed in his lunch, responded with a dismissive no, and when prompted by his dining companion about the bluntness, he nonchalantly revealed, I told him, go expletive yourself. This audacious attitude was quintessentially Wells, a man who spent a significant portion of his life delivering blunt rebukes to producers, directors, and corporate figures, many of whom held the power to shape his career, but often chose not to. Even in dealings with advertisers who paid him generously for his voiceover work, Wells managed to find fault and lamented being overlooked in favor of his old adversary, John Houseman. Wells, the genius behind Citizen Kane, often downplayed his own masterpiece, once describing it as a dollar book fruit. His career trajectory was marked by a series of unconventional choices, abandoned projects, and clashes with the industry, a phenomenon aptly termed Caddick by Peter Biskin. While Wells, the filmmaker, may have faced criticism for his erratic career path, Wells, the conversationalist, 
earned adoration for his sardonic charm. My Lunches with Orson, a compilation of Wells's candid conversations transcribed in the lead-up to his death in 1985, provides a glimpse into his unfiltered commentary on the film industry. Actors, in particular, bore the brunt of Wells's acerbic observations. Marlon Brando's physique was likened to a huge sausage, a shoe made of flesh, and Betta Davis faced a harsher critique as Wells expressed his aversion not only to her acting but also to her appearance. Even Humphrey Bogart, recognized for his acting prowess, wasn't spared, with Wells labeling him a coward who only picked fights when well covered by busboys. Spencer Tracy's relocation to a ranch in Chino, California, coincided with his attempt to distance himself from his extramarital affairs and the shadows of Sunset Boulevard's brothels. Renowned movie director Joseph Mankiewicz encapsulated Tracy's departure from his wife, Louise, stating, he didn't leave Louise, he left the scene of his guilt. Tracy's amorous escapades were an open secret in Hollywood, with a roster of famous actresses including Myrna Loy, Greta Garbo, Hedy Lamar, Loretta Young, Betty Davis, Jean Harlow, Joan Bennett, Olivia de Havilland, Joan Fontaine, and Joan Crawford gracing his list of conquests. Mankiewicz unabashedly remarked that nobody at MGM gets more sex than Spencer Tracy. In 1940, Tracy's infatuation with Ingrid Bergman led to a threat to quit a role if Lana Turner was cast instead. Despite Bergman's marital status and maternal responsibilities, Tracy seduced her, and MGM carefully crafted an image of Tracy as Bergman's mentor. However, Tracy's passionate liaison with Bergman was fleeting, making way for the enduring love affair of his life with Katharine Hepburn. Tracy and Hepburn's romance unfolded during the filming of Woman of the Year in 1941, enduring for 26 years. Despite the film world's awareness of their affair, the public remained oblivious to Tracy's double life as a happily married, devoutly Catholic actor. Tracy and Hepburn meticulously maintained separate lives, even conducting their trysts in discreet locations like Barmore Castle in Northumberland. However, Tracy's insatiable appetites transcended even a passionate affair with Hepburn. Irene Dunn, Tracy's co-star, described him as rude and brusque and revealed his harassment, prompting her to complain to MGM co-founder Louis B. Mayer. In October 1942, the United States was still suffering the consequences of the attacks that had occurred 10 months earlier at Pearl Harbor across the Pacific, and the Australians were locked in fierce battles against the Japanese on the sea. Land and sea, especially in the Solomon Islands. On October 17, when Japan violently attacked American forces on Guadalcanal, news about an Australian-born man beloved by many Americans appeared in the press. It was the first news report of a dark and beautiful story in Los Angeles that would capture the public's attention. Actor Errol Flynn was accused of raping a girl at a party in Bel Air. Flynn's troubles escalated four days after two more charges were brought against him for the double rape of a teenage girl on his yacht a year earlier. This begins a fascinating Hollywood story, opening a window into a world radically different from that of the war's participants. In this elite world, sacrifice and suffering are nowhere to be seen, and the lawsuit over rape laws over Flynn's age involves the biggest movie star of the era. Within seven years, Flynn had transformed from an unknown Australian, a Warner Brothers actor like millions of others, into a Hollywood icon thanks to being cast in the lead role in the 1935 film Captain Blood. Flynn quickly became an icon. His action hero, a combination of demonic beauty and colonialist masculinity, exemplified in fight scenes where he is often armed with a sword. Sword, helping him earn the nickname Swordsman. In 1942, legal proceedings began against Flynn on three charges of statutory rape related to the Bel Air party and his yacht. At the same time, moviegoers were watching him play Australian Air Force pilot Terry Forbes, paired with future U. 
S. President Ronald Reagan in a dramatic but unrealistic anti-fascist play, The Great Journey. Hope, as America's war escalated, Flynn, along with hundreds and thousands of others, attempted to enlist in the United States military. At the time of Flynn's trial, he had just been granted U.S. citizenship due to an infected lung, forcing him to play a war hero on screen. Marlon Brando, in light of revelations about mistreatment and abuse, emerges as a troubled figure, leaving a legacy of pain and suffering in his wake. Rita Moreno, sharing insights into her nearly decade-long relationship with Brando, disclosed a tumultuous and toxic dynamic that drove her to contemplate suicide. In an interview for Variety's Actors on Actors series with Jessica Chastain, Moreno revealed the distressing episodes of her relationship with Brando. She expressed excitement about being with the Hollywood legend, but detailed the ways in which he mistreated her, pushing her to the brink of despair. Moreno's candid admission included a shocking revelation of a suicide attempt with pills at Brando's house. He and I had had a relationship for almost eight years. Ultimately, it was exciting to be with Marlon. Oh my God, it was exciting. He was extraordinary in many, many ways, but he was a bad, bad guy. He was a bad guy when it came to women, shared Moreno, painting a troubling picture of Brando's behavior. This revelation echoes other instances of Brando's questionable conduct, notably documented in his mistreatment of Maria Schneider during the filming of Last Tango in Paris. Schneider, the co-star, expressed feeling violated and humiliated during scenes, raising questions about Brando's treatment of women on and off screen. Moreno reflected on her past self, acknowledging her vulnerability and inability to stand up against Brando's mistreatment. She described herself as a different person, lacking the strength to resist the destructive dynamics of the relationship. While some may argue about speaking ill of the dead, Moreno's decision to share her experiences prompts a necessary conversation about accountability. Even in retrospect, Brando's complex life, marked by personal tragedy and trauma, doesn't absolve him of responsibility for mistreating women. Moreno's courage in bringing these issues to light challenges the notion of posthumous immunity for celebrated figures and emphasizes the importance of confronting uncomfortable truths. William Claude Dukenfield, a gambler and card shark, a gin drinker, and hater of children, was an iconic actor and comedian. He was also known as a pool hustler, a juggler, and an ordinary man struggling against life. Some widely held beliefs about him were true, while others were part of the act. But above all, the cantankerous man with a bulbous nose and a drawling voice was one of the funniest, richest, and most influential comics of the 20th century. While Charlie Chaplin drew our sympathy, Buster Keaton earned our astonishment, and the Marx Brothers made us blush. Field spoke directly to what made us human our dark desires, the unspoken urge for meanness, the depravity which we all held quietly, all the while making us laugh when he got away. With it, a man like Fields reminded audiences of themselves, but they hated to admit it. William Claude Dukenfield, the American comedian and actor, was indeed known for having a short temper. While he was beloved for his comedic talents and unique persona, off-screen he could be irritable and had a reputation for being difficult to work with. When Fields felt others weren't taking his work seriously or when he encountered obstacles during production, he would become frustrated. Despite his sometimes challenging demeanor, W.C. Fields' comedic genius and unique style left a lasting legacy in the world of comedy and entertainment. His contributions to film and comedy continue to be celebrated, even if his off-screen personality was known for its sharp edges. Humphrey Bogart one of the biggest stars of Hollywood's golden age, is known for playing gruff and brooding characters in movies like The Maltese Falcon and The African Queen, for which he won an Academy Award, among many others. According to M.B., perhaps Bogart's most iconic role came in 1942, 
when he played Rick Blaine opposite Ingrid Bergman in Casablanca. In this classic love story, Bogart fully explored his darker side, and the movie would go on to earn eight Academy Award nominations, winning three. According to M. Bev, how much of Bogart's portrayal of Blaine was acting and how much of it was true to life? Based on reports of his onset behavior, he was a lot more like Blaine than you might expect. Aside from Casablanca being a troubled movie from the start, according to Alicia, the script was based on a play that had never been produced and needed a complete reworking. A series of writers were brought onto the production, and it's even said that Bergman didn't know how the movie would end or which leading man her character would end up with at the resolution because the script remained unfinished even as they were filming. All this combined, as well as a long list of personal issues, may have influenced Bogart throughout the film's production. The video ends here. Remember, there are still many other interesting and engaging videos in my playlist. Before you leave, please leave a comment number one if you found the video interesting, or number two if not. It's that simple, isn't it? Thank you.